Good afternoon, everyone. Record snowfall across the Northeast and Central United States. This late in the season, it's pushing towards summer right now. Six plus inches of snow in Maine, Vermont. This is what the media is calling a dusting of snow to try to throw you off the trail that something is indeed cooling in our climate. 3.4 inches, that is considered a dusting anymore. Vermont, seven and a half inches. Cleveland, Ohio, obviously heavy accumulation to be on the roads like this. Pennsylvania, Michigan, again, trace of snow. You'll see how the pictures are so misleading there. U.S. highways closed in Tennessee due to ice and snow across the Cumberland Gap. Epic floods in Florida. No hurricane yet this deep of rainfall. And here we have these jokers at the Weather Channel calling like three months ago that this will be much above average springtime temperatures. AccuWeather again, completely wrong forecast, calling for early summer-like heat in this time, and it's snowing, yet we're supposed to consider them the experts? I don't think so. If you thought the snows across the Northeast and Central United States were rare a couple weeks before summer, China is experiencing the exact same thing. Let's take a look through Mount Emeishan. So rare tourists are up there taking photos. Seven inches in Gansu. A full-on blizzard with two and a half feet of snow in Xinjiang. House collapsed because of snow weight and they rescued this woman. Unbelievable footage. This is up near Beijing in Hebei. It's that thick, wet, heavy snow. And across the top 10 headlines today, four of them are weather related across China with rainstorms, flooding, atmospheric compression events, windstorms. And to top it all off with the drought and cold and extreme wet, they're going to have trouble growing crops this year. We'll take a look at the wheat production as well as the imports of China that are going to skyrocket. Extreme snowfall across Europe in May, damaging almost all fruit crops. This is what 80% loss of European cherry crop will look like after they thaw out. They burst. You cannot sell these. Austrian apple orchards. Austrian wine, 13% loss throughout the entire eastern region. Swiss agriculture covered in ice. Rape seed from Polish frost and insect damage. Bulgaria's biggest cherry growing region decimated. Hungary apricot, cherry, and apple orchards look like this. Frozen solid, not going to be able to sell any of this produce that's on the tree. Southern Italy, water and frost damage. Tajikistan cherry orchards wiped out. Apricots from Spain down 30%. Total European production of apricots 16% down. Ukraine 100% loss. Turkey 30% loss of cherries. Palm oil on the rise in Asia. Mexico hail damage in the millions of dollars for vegetables. USA cherry, apple, and peaches down 30%. Add on top of this all the heavy rains in France, and it's down 7% on its wheat production from last year. With Austria experiencing almost an 80% loss of its fruit production throughout May, and frost damaging vineyards across Europe, images of Swiss vineyards, fires lit to try to keep everything from dying from frost, usually balmy, incredibly beautiful Austria countryside, What's left is a frost-damaged wasteland that has so far destroyed 13% of all wine production across Austria. More than 6,000 hectares were damaged, the regions that were most heavily affected, and to what the exact losses were. Pacific Ocean temperatures drop off the fastest ever recorded. Sunspots as well just plummeting would explain the cool spring. The forecast is for us to enter a grand solar minimum this year. And on top of this, we're about to experience one of the most intense La Niñas ever. As usual with the news today, if you don't live in Maine or Vermont area, you won't see very much about these record snowstorms that are coming through dumping four to seven inches of snow just a couple of weeks away from summertime. This is the all-time most recorded snow and the latest snows ever recorded in this part of the country. This is the middle of May, 
six plus inches across main area. You can see the totals here, 7.5 being the max all the way down to the lowlands with half an inch. This is not exclusively mountainous areas. This is all the way down into the lowlands as well. This is the depth of the snow that's come down over the last week up there. Depths on the cars, this is right in the city there, what the roads are looking like. And interestingly enough, almost three and a half inches of snow is just considered a dusting now in our media. Please note how they use the word dusting when that's a significant amount of record-breaking snow yet it's labeled a dusting. Nelson's Crag, literally a month before summer, record-breaking snow. Now this is funny because on AccuWeather when I pulled this two inches plus off the Caribou Main image, look at the blue highlight. U.S. summer forecast is going to have more 90 degree days, but as you see they've called everything wrong so far. Main roads covered. It takes a lot of snow to cover a road. Those things are heat islands and it takes an enormous amount of cold snow to get and blanket those. It is melt off so fast. Flurries melt off. Snowfalls do not. Better look at here over the field. This is in Vermont. Again, seven and a half inches, one to two inches, four to five inches, depending on where you're at up there. Now I pulled up the main average snowfall for April. Notice that there's not even a listing for May because it never snows in May. And it did back in 1902, 1972. There's been two instances of snow, but it was in the very first of May, May 3rd, 4th, 5th. This is literally three weeks later. They don't even have a listing for May in their snow results. Brisk, unseasonably cold air. Brisk, with record-breaking snowstorms, should be labeled as such. I ran down the chart here of the record latest snowfalls. Let's look through the east, Ohio Valley, Midwest, and West. Clearly, as you can see, in the east, Burlington, Vermont, let's use that as our proxy. Half an inch, they just got seven and a half inches. That's literally 15 times the record broken. We're going to run down through this chart here, through the different areas that it did snow so you can see. Keep in mind Detroit, Michigan, Cleveland, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as we go through our list. Here's Cleveland, speaking of. Now the last reported snow on May 10th in 1907 was two-tenths of an inch of snow. This time they got over three inches. We're literally at that 15 times mark breaking the record again. 20 degree below normal temperatures. Sunday morning in Northeast Ohio. Cleveland could barely even run their marathon because the streets were covered in snow. Can you imagine a marathon in the snow? Frost potential. This comes off AccuWeather here, talking about the frost potential throughout the areas in pink. That's a giant area. That's not a little pocket, as they called it, a pocket of cold frost possibility. That's literally the entire Northeast United States. This misphrasing of everything to draw you offline I think they're blatantly lying right now, to tell you my opinion. Having frost, and this is not that unusual at this time of the year. Well, you know what? It certainly is because they don't even have records going back having snow in Maine in May. So I'm going to say that it is unusual. If you wanted to know what types of fruits and vegetables are going to increase in price due to the cold weather damage, here is a nice list for you. Strawberries, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers, and squash. These will all rise in price due to the limited availability and die off from the cold in the Northeast United States. Price rises on all these guaranteed. Look here at the temperature departure from normal. Let's take a look into Michigan. A trace of snow. This is what the last recorded 1973 trace of snow. Now this year, 2016, we get it again, but clearly look at this picture. Stop for just a moment. Do you consider this a trace of snow? A trace is blotchy here and there, a few flurries. This is accumulation. Now when we search the record books, one-tenth of one inch was recorded. Now that is a trace of snow, but that was back in 1912. So you must ask yourself in those previous images going on two to three inches, if we do simple mathematics, got one-tenth of one inch of snow and three inches. High strangeness in Pennsylvania as well. Snow falls there, but it came down on these iced pellets, snow pellets. And Phillipsburg, another look at the strange snow pellets, not even really snow, a hail snow kind of combination mix. Temperatures in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, record broken. 
Let's take a look at the measurable snowfalls. Again, I just showed you a barrage there of Cleveland, Ohio, two tenths of a, an inch, but you saw significantly higher amounts there. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, half an inch. Ah, that's borderline the record. Now here's a look at all-time single greatest snowstorms that occurred during April and May. Now there's only one listing for May in Montana. And by the way, it snowed in Montana as well as Wyoming. Feet. So the latest there is May 27th to 29th on a mountaintop in Butte, Montana. All the other listings are for April. As you can see, we are in uncharted territory on this grand solar minimum. Now, if you think Northeast United States, okay, we're getting up toward Canada. Let's go down into Tennessee in the Southeast United States. You know, it's borders with Georgia. That's a warm area of the United States during spring and summer. But U.S. Highway 441 closed due to snow and ice this time of the year. Gatlinburg, Cherokee, tourist area up there, well known. It's in the Smoking Mountains National Park area. Now this is what closed the roads. Look at the sideways blowing ice accumulations on that fire hydrant. That was not drifting down snow. That was 50 to 60 mile an hour winds blowing sideways ice and sleet. This is Klingman's Dome. This is a great place to go hiking, by the way. Look at somebody's balcony and deck off there. Again, the accumulations that came down in the mountains during those days. Jumped over into the temperature averages for this time of the year. It should be pushing almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're looking at about a 50 degree difference in normalized temperatures. Colder at higher elevations, obvious, but not usually snow this time of the year. And also the National Park Service for the Smoky Mountains National Park. How can your advisory temporary road closure be offline? You know, even during the time of that road closure you had to go to twitter to get your news are you kidding me you're supposed to be a u.s government agency but we need to go to twitter to find out really what's happening social media becomes our new truth platforms speaking of half truths and bent reality here we go weather network above normal temperatures this is where their spring forecast was back in february above normal temperatures for this time of the year yeah that that's wrong Mid to late spring pattern above normal, warm and dry, wrong again. Temperature forecast, weather channel, much above average. For the May forecast, absolutely wrong. The last day of frost varies considerably. Yeah, and you didn't even put the western United States there. So all these snowstorms happening in California, Montana, Wyoming, etc. aren't even included. They didn't want you to see that information. Let's jump over to Europe for a moment. Again, we're going to stay with AccuWeather, but notice over the UK, take a look. You know what they're calling cold now? Limited heat. I'm not, I'm not making that up. Limited heat is the way they're trying to rephrase cold because it's becoming so common that there's no way to hide the global warming lies anymore. It's just impossible. It's in your face. It's everywhere. The Northern Hemisphere is being blanketed in cold and snow weeks before summer starts. And they, this is unexplainable for the global warming crowd, so they need to rename it. Remember, when I grew up, it was called global warming. Now it's called climate change. You know, I used to call it cold. Now they call it limited heat. I guess we have to put a new listing in the Webster's Dictionary for this. Limited heat, formerly known as cold. Palm Springs, California, nice and sunny May. It has to be warm. No, right here we go. Snowstorm, not just a little snow, blanketing snows over the forest on the mountaintops there. As we look through these images, do you think that's a dusting? Again, the media calling it just trace amounts of snow. That is inches that have fallen. In Great Falls, Montana, looking at 5 to 10 inches over that time. Cheyenne, Wyoming, again, well, it is above 10,000 feet, but they received a foot and a half. Taking a look a little further south, Washington, D.C., further down Virginia, we're getting into just barely the high 30 Fahrenheit range for this. That's record cold. Props to Weatherbell for actually putting blue and different colors of cool within their map there. Everywhere else where it's 40 degrees, it's yellow. And that signifies heat in the old maps, but now they've just changed cold into hot. So truth is lies and lies is truth. Now let's not leave out Iowa. Let's jump over into the Midwest. Record cold, record cold, record cold. Dallas-Fort Worth, record cold. It is occurring everywhere. It is so obvious now. And when you look at these last measurable snowfalls, 
I put this chart through a few times just so we could keep up with the dates. There's so many listed here. Out west, you know, they're looking at two tenths of an inch. And this is feet of snow. This is multiple inches of snow, but these last records were just fractions of an inch. It's exponential amounts breaking records, but not making the news at all. It shouldn't. It's a global warming agenda. Here's another anomaly. As more cosmic rays penetrate our atmosphere due to a decreased magnetosphere, as you would expect during a solar minimum, we're going to start to get these torrential rains flipped upside down. This is not even a hurricane. This is a foot of rain with no hurricane off of one of these absolutely an atmospheric compression event. Again, which we witnessed on the equator twice last year with the three feet of hail in Quito and then Bogota. This is another atmospheric compression event right before your very eyes. And if we look out into the forecast through today, you'll start to see that they're still expecting snow out west in several locations. The 16th also snow, snow, snow. This is all normal, isn't it? Instant weather maps decides that 10 degrees is still yellow. How cold does it have to be before you show blue and cold on the map? Anyway, look at the UK, it's 15 degrees Celsius. These are Celsius temperatures, not Fahrenheit. And then look over into Moscow, far right of the map if you don't know where Russia is, but in that whole area where Siberia is actually warmer than the UK. And again, I thought that no way, so I jumped over on a world weather map where they do have some markings. And again, you'll see Moscow and London are the exact same temperatures, but it's weird because in Siberia, it's five degrees C warmer, which is about uh, eight and a half, nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than Moscow would be. So the weather's starting to flip up and down. And when we come in now to the La Nina, which is going to intensify from this year forward, I am calling a significant absolute dropout in the stock market this year coming up right now, probably June or July. They're going to lock you down so you can't move. B, when the La Nina starts, we are going to get into the first global food shortages coming up through this season. Corn prices are going to double by October. Moving through 2017, you're going to see absolutely significant wipeouts of wheat and corn production globally. I'm going to do a report on China, what's happening up there. They just got feet of snow. Australia, hailstorms dropping crops everywhere. But China was really badly hurt on their harvest because everything that came up through the ground when they planted early was just totally frozen and wiped out. Now you'll start to see the same thing on ag web through the United States, trying to catch up on all that. We are out of time. It has begun. Time is up. You better get ready for plan B. You're going to have to know how to grow food. No question about it. You are going to need to organize with your neighborhoods. You are going to have to get into your communities and time is up. I am sorry. We are out of time. Look today through CCTV and Xinhua news. You'll see that the top 10 stories coming out of China are weather related. We have mega floods, several locations across the country affecting grain production, heavy rains, wind storms, and these are absolutely atmospheric compression events like we saw in Florida with those almost foot of rain with no hurricane. They're experiencing the same thing in the central and southern areas here in China. Additionally, blizzards in Xinjiang rare snows across Sichuan province, also Gansu province, and Hebei province. That is four provinces borderline in Yunnan as well, which would make five provinces with snow, and it is just weeks before summer. This comes right on the heels of the coldest winter they've had in 60 to 80 years across the entire Asian continent this year. This was when all the boats were frozen in harbor across the entire coastline of northeastern China when they had those ice pancakes that locked down the entire coastal region for weeks. Now I pulled back the weather chart here in April so you can't come and say, well, you're just pulling up the May chart. Well, let's look at the April temperatures where it should be. Around 30 degrees, a little bit south of Beijing is where the one snowstorm is happening. Chengdu in the far west where it says southwest, that's where the other snowstorm is happening. It should be 27 degrees. Gansu is a little bit north of that. And Urumuchi out in Xinjiang in the far west is where the other snowstorms are occurring. So let's take a look right in Sichuan. This is a grain vegetable production area. Wet heavy snows blanketing the mountains there, especially Omeishan, which is a major tourist draw. People are going up there just to take photos of the snow. It's so rare. 
they haven't really had many instances of this, except going back into the records and taking a look at, guess what? The Yuan Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty, right before they collapsed. Taking a look at Gansu, this is an amazing area up here. We're going to take a look in Hezhou City. This is the area in Gannan. Like I say, wow, just stunning countryside up here with Tibetan monasteries, hiking galore, uh, yaks, you name it. Their average temperatures for May should be around 15 C, but they just got seven inches of snow, completely rare even in that area. Take a look in Hoodswell downtown. Look at the thickness of the snow, especially on the cars. Look at the accumulation there through the city center. Now the cities are heat islands anyway, so for it to accumulate that much on the streets, roads, trees, and byways around in the actual city, you know, it had to be a lot heavier and denser just in the countryside. As you know, there's no Twitter, etc. in China. They're pretty locked down on their media there. I had to use central state media to get this report. It's the best I can do. Bear with me. Inner Mongolia, otherwise known as Neimongu, they had this house collapse because of snow weight, and they had the rescue live here on film. This woman was completely buried, people running in with shovels, and they actually pulled her out. I was like, whoa, that's some of the most amazing rescue footage. People were digging with their bare hands to get her out. Wow, I'm going to give props to those rescuers there. Hebei province, which is right near Beijing. Now, Chengde is the area in exactly where it snowed. Now, we could take a look at what the average high and low temperatures historically are. Now, this occurred on the 14th. Should be 74 degrees. But we get blankets of snow coming across that area. This is rare and unusual as well. It should not be snowing like this. Two weeks before summer in China, this is considered one of the furnaces of China. There's actually four cities where it gets incredibly hot in the summer. And it gets incredibly cold in the winter. This is one of the four furnace cities. Should be scalding hot around 30 there right now, but they're getting snow. Now let's go completely out west into Udumuchi and Xinjiang. They just had a blizzard out there. Closing roads amok through everywhere. Had to come in with heavy machinery to get through and unblock several of the passes and the different roadways through the, the valleys there. You can see the depth and accumulation. That is not a couple inches. That's feet. Now this is the wheat growing areas in question. Now you can see those last provinces that are overlapping where all this snow and these floods are occurring. Definitely having a little effect this year on grain production. Now if we look at the top 15 wheat producing regions of the planet, China is in that area. So if Chinese production is stifled or stymied, they're going to have to start importing more. Now Brazil's in a drought. For the corn, etc. You know, China does import soy, rice, wheat, and corn. So their central government's going to be looking for tens of millions of extra tons of grain to import this year due to the offset losses that are occurring right now. If we take a look at the crop monitor, this is a global. I'll start you off with a small chart here just so we can see the crops. The legend is at the very bottom on the right side. You can see maize, which is corn. We got wheat, soybeans, and rice take a look over in China where you see the red and yellow those are difficult growing conditions currently Southeast Asia and you look at Turkey right above Africa there don't know why they're not reporting anything that's a major breadbasket area as well if we look at South America extreme drought down there so absolutely poor harvest for soya and maize that's a little bit more in-depth chart that shows you the reason for the coloration on the map here. Now I wanted to draw your attention right in the central area into Southeast Asia. That little snowflake means cold. The next symbol to the right means drought and the crop affected is rice. Isn't that interesting? I thought it was supposed to be the warmest year ever. And here we are growing difficulties with our crops because of cold two weeks before summer officially starts. And actually in Southeast Asia, it is summertime already. You know, in North America, it's lagging behind a couple of weeks. But once it hits into April, first weeks of May are considered summer down there. So it's actually cold in summer officially. Now, when we do look in the Chinese areas for production, that little rain cloud means floods are affecting planting. And also the soil conditions, you can't really plant in muddy, soggy soils as such. So if we take a look in the overlap where the grain production is, 
with that map we just looked at, you can see there's going to be a significant push on spring wheat prices coming out of China. Inner Mongolia, Neimongu, that's at one affected area. Hebei, just south of Beijing. And if we jump down to far west where it says Chengdu in Sichuan, that's the Ume snows. If you come further south down around Taiwan, you get down to Hong Kong, Hainan Island. That's the area that's having all the flooding. So you can see there's a tremendous strain on the crops this year there. This is not rocket science. We're not looking into a crystal ball. We're not using magic. We're using history. Cycles repeat. You can see the playbook and where it's going pretty clearly right now. I, along with others, was calling this last year that it, intensification will begin this year. There'll be crop losses due to drought and cold. And these countries that generally grow all of our commercial grain crops and cereal crops are going to have to start importing, which is going to push the price on food globally. So you know what? Market, I'm calling it right now, corn at 750 US to 8 US a bushel by October this year. That's going to be doubling the corn price. Market right now. That's my forecast. As expected, getting into the grand solar minimum. There will be global food shortages. What you're seeing right here is the very tippy tip of the iceberg of crop losses expected over the next five years. With the intensification coming at the end of this year with a lot of wipeout of corn and wheat expected into 2017, your food price will be three to five times what it is right now. Let's take a look at the early signs that the grand solar minimum is upon us. Extreme snowfalls wiping out most of the fruit crop or large percentages across Europe, the United States, Asia in May. We'll take a look at Europe first. That extends all the way over to the Russian Federation in Ukraine, all the way down to Turkey. 80% loss of the entire European cherry crop this year in 2016 covered in ice and rain. And if you think the cherries look bad, you might as well look at what the blooms look like on the apple orchards there that did come out in the lower elevations. Apple, peach, and cherry orchards look like icicles instead of trees. Minimum 100 million euros, and that was a few weeks ago on the estimates there, and that was just for fruit orchards. That didn't include any of the wine growing. It was such a total loss that the government had to introduce a frost and snow damage insurance policy because so many Austrian insurers were unable to pay the claims out just on the fruit damage from the farmers. The headlines reading massive damage, fruit farmers, total crop failures, the government's largest amount of damage they've ever seen in fruit at one time across this region. We look into the wine growing areas in the east of the country. It should be verdant and green leaves across everything. But due to the frost, 13.7% total loss on the entire yield out of Austria this year for their wine production. Taking a look, minimum 6,000 hectares damaged. You can freeze the screen here and take a look at which region and how many hectares by which type of varietal grown in the east of Austria. You can see where the losses are at. The vineyard's looking something like this. The areas in question and the exact percentages of loss so far. But again, this was printed two weeks ago. Just trying to do a wrap up here. The numbers would have changed by that, increasing the totals. Nets are no protection against this type of deluge that's coming down. And then right away, the massive hailstorms that blanketed through the Chablis area in France also took part of the Austrian agriculture out at the same time and add on top of the hail damaged wine vineyards all the flooding taking place so the French wheat crop is down seven or eight percent from last year's totals but as the fields continue to get soggy and more reports come in this number will definitely increase taking a look at western Bulgaria the area in gray is where they grow the most cherries in the country Generally producing 37,000 tons, but they're looking around 6,000 tons right now. Also plums, apricots, and peaches all damaged. And to back up the prediction of food price rises, last year 1.5, this year 6. That's nearly a five times increase just on the fruit prices in Bulgaria. The totals coming out in early May are 80 to 100% loss. 
Volcanic eruptions, don't forget those. Affecting agriculture, just a ping on Costa Rica here. Nicaragua experiencing the same. And there's 42 volcanoes erupting currently on this planet. You can understand how some of the volcanic ash could act as nuclei to produce rain showers. Anywhere the volcanic ash is falling, the animals cannot graze. And it will affect crop production gradually across the planet. Mexico, hail damage to zucchini and onions in the millions of U.S. dollars. Back to the damage in Germany and Switzerland, Croatia. This is what Swiss agriculture was experiencing. European rapeseed, Germany and Polish frost killed off part of the crop. Down at least a million tons in production, minimum. These are the net solutions that just didn't work throughout the central regions of Europe. It was just too heavy with the snow and ice and collapsed everything. Hungary, 30% loss of its apricot a view of the frost damage across the country. Minimum another 76 million euro in this country. So what's that bring us up to? Almost 200 million euro in two countries. Frost damage was immense, at least 30%. This is what the fruit looks like. Frozen on the trees. Let's go to southern Italy. And you have to think to yourself, no, it couldn't have had frost damage in southern Italy. Yes, it did, along with rain. So this is what the cherries look like. After they were frost damaged and then rained on, split open, unsellable. Close up here for you. This is what the hails look like raining down. That's the depth of the hail that pummeled the orchards and left damage in its wake. Now, if you thought the European frosts were a little strange, let's jump right over into Russia here. They had a foot and a half of snow right on the border with China. The area in red in question closed highways and roads. In the Mogochinsky district, right in the area where the three rivers come together, average temperature should be around 26 or so degrees. Beautiful area, forested, but they had so much snow that highways were closed. Let's jump over into Spain. Stone fruit, another name for those uh, fruits that have incredibly hard pits like plums, apricots. Rains damage production. Down 30%, but if we look at the total throughout Europe, the entire European total is down 16% at the minimum for the apricot harvest. Now this is, again, the early damage totals that were coming in through the middle of May into the last week of May. Now we don't have the updated totals, but with all the rains, hail, etc. that swept through Europe in the last seven days, these numbers should be increasing as well. Spain cherries down 80%. There's a specific Bajo cherry that lost 80%. That's a specialty grade agriculture product there. So normal production, 80% down in Spain. Let's take a look at Tajikistan. Cherry orchard decimated. Swiss fruit farmers taking the same approach to heat what's growing above ground as the Austrians did when they lit up fires to protect their wine vineyards. The same ghostly look throughout the landscape. This is what Swiss farmers were doing to prepare their apricot trees against frost damage. But this is what the Swiss vineyards look like. Oh, the nets just didn't work when they try to protect their crops. So going forward, these protection measures of using nets will no longer be viable. We're going to have to switch to different agricultural methods to protect our crops from now on. And this is what I mean about growing techniques are going to need to radically change and in the fastest Manhattan style worldwide collaborative project i don't care what government you're from what nationality you are but we are going to have to work together as a species to start quickly revamping our growing techniques so there will be enough food for all of us on this planet and it is started there's no starting it's started it's in play it's going to rapidly decrease in temperature this fall with the sunspot drop off and into next year with the la nina you are going to see something that is going to make you shake your head and say that is impossible. But the impossible will suddenly be possible. And you will be questioning how you could have believed global warming all of these years. Back into Switzerland. This is an area border between the vineyards and the fruit orchards. But they say use the same technique, lighting fires between the trees. And this is just an otherworldly image here coming out. That's an entire countryside they're trying to warm up. 
Turkey, 30% cherry loss. Ukraine, 100% losses in apricots, as well as cherry damages. Okay, so it was 4 to 6 C below zero in May. Now that is around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So that last week of April and first weeks of May, those are extremely low temperatures, which would be expected because in the Monde minimum in the 1600s, they had to move the wine growing regions from where we currently grow wine way further south into Spain. And if you thought Europe and maybe a bit of Asia experienced cold temperatures and crop losses, let's move over to the United States. Significant losses of fruit crops across the U.S. Cherries reduced by 50% through California. This would also be neighboring areas where they do grow fruit because, as you saw, those heavy windstorms, rainstorms, snowstorms that came through, and it's still snowing in the mountains. Bing cherry crop dropping from 18 million boxes down to 1 million boxes. That is such a heavy loss. That's almost an entire wipeout of the industry in itself. Peach crop in Connecticut. That's the Northeast states that experienced record snow and record cold in May. That was 15 times the normal, seven times the record from the previous records. And you can see how hail damage, this includes the southern states around Utah, getting down near the border with Mexico, Texas, back up and around New York, apple orchards snowed on when they were not expecting that at all. Vineyard losses across the U.S. Blueberries took a severe beating after they bloomed and then got flash frozen and then tried to bloom again. Asian palm oil on the rise. It should alleviate when La Nina starts and they get a bit more rainfall. But Australia itself, hail damage, hail damage, hail damage. All through the wheat growing regions, just stripping everything. I'm betting more than a 5 to 7% loss overall in Australia's wheat crop this year due to the cold, the wet, and the hail. This is some intense hail that came down in Myanmar. Look at the size of that. That's Southeast Asia way down near the equator. And if we're using a proxy and the baseline is the known fact of what a grand solar minimum does and what the expected outcomes of a grand solar minimum would be based on historical records and written accounts of how the weather changed. You know, the Thames River froze and they had frost fairs in the UK. Over in, the, over in the U.S., colonies barely survived. And once you know that, that that's what we're repeating and we're going into right now, when you see that the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, the AMO, is going on its cool phase for the next 30 years, dropping in temperature across the North Atlantic, and the Pacific temperatures are dropping like a rock, most recorded in history ever, the steepest drop-off. So that'll take the Pacific into a cold phase. At the same time, the sunspot has actually gone down to zero for the last two days. So that is a straight drop off a cliff down to zero. You have all these factors on top of each other. And you can see why the weather's not what it should be, why it's getting cold. And you know, the snow is probably going to start in September this year. It's going to get extremely cold. When we look back in history and you start to see these zero sunspot months that are not on the regular pattern of the 11-year cycle, we look right around early 1800s. So at the very minimum, we're going to go back 200 years in cold temperature. And if we look at the amplitude wave, you can see that we are going to be right around that same sunspotless area at the very minimum, 200 year cold, 200 year floods. Get ready for it. Expect it. And the paper released last year by Professor Valentina Zarkova, talked about how the different dynamo layers in the sun would have an opposite rotational and one would slow down so fast that it would create such a disturbance in the oscillation on the sun. And then we suddenly get this polar magnetic field strength diverging so far across. And I wonder why with this data information instantly available at our fingertips, this chart's still a year and a half behind. And I wonder now how far the red line, the Southern Hemisphere, has diverged from the blue line in the Northern Hemisphere. But that information just seems to still not be available, and I wonder why. Cycles of time. Look at the past to predict the future. It's a cycle. It comes around every 400 years. We're back into it. 
The intensity of the cold is unknown. It could be a 1200 year cold. It could be something from the 1200 era, which would put us in the 800 year cold. We could go back to the 1600s, which would put us right in that 400 era. So far, we're getting and creeping right into the 200 year cold records along with snow and ice. And you can expect it to intensify when the sunspots really drop out here going forward into the end of the year and the two oceans get cold. You'll understand that man is not responsible for the warming or the changes or anything on this planet that is a natural cycle. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can do to stop this. But it can be survived if you're prepared and if you work with your communities and if you have a plan to grow food and organize with other people on how to get through this. So many people write me and say, how can I survive this? It can be survived. It's always been survived. I mean, 75% of the people survived during the Maunder Minimum. 90% of the people survived during the Dalton Minimum. So it's just about you getting ready mentally, spiritually, physically, and surrounding yourself with good people that you can trust so you can get things done and still maintain some comfort in your lives so you can thrive and come out on the other side of this. Totals are starting to be tallied right now of the intense, catastrophic cold damage that Europe experienced through the beginning, middle of May. Austria as a country, its entire fruit production has been put in the loss range of around 80%. The smallest number that insurers are talking about right now are 100 million euro. And that is not including grapes. This is only for cherries and assorted fruit. Now with frost damage and a look at this otherworldly landscape of fires throughout the vineyards to try to warm up literally a countryside against frost damage. Agro insurance headlines, fruit farmers facing total losses, extreme snowfall and frost damage across Europe. This is one single country. They lost 80% of their fruit and 13% of their wine production. It got so bad, in fact, that the Austrian government has to bail out insurance companies that have gone bankrupt trying to just pay out the farm losses. The extreme weather parliament actually decided to implement its own governmental crop insurance loss to try to reduce the failures of the insurance companies. Just yesterday, heavy hail storms are now taking a toll throughout the apricot and different fruits that are growing. A look at what happened in the last week and first weeks of May here. They tried to put nets over to protect crops, but as you see that snow and sleet and ice came down just too heavy and collapsed everything. Stiermark should be balmy with green throughout the valleys at this time of the year. But what they're left with in Eastern Austria, specifically the Southeast areas are just frost damage, dead vines. Everything had flowered in the warmer spring. And then when the cold came, it just killed everything that was out in bloom. The minimums they're looking at currently are 6,000 hectares. A minimum of 20 million in Lower Austria and another five or six million across other regions, but these are still not the final totals. If you take a look at the total cultivated area by grape variety and hectares, the totals come in around 45,000 hectares, of which 6,000 guaranteed were destroyed. They still don't know what the production will be because there was so much frost damage across the entire region that what are perceived to be healthy plants might not have the yield that would be expected. So they really won't know until harvest time. These are the two regions that are most affected. And if we dive further through Austrian wine, it goes through each individual wine growing region by the percentage loss in that actual region. A lot of these names I cannot pronounce. I'm not even going to attempt, but you can see it runs anywhere from 60% on the high to 15% on the low with the averages probably being between 20 and 30%. Going forward, I'm making a prediction here for Europe with the Pacific water temperatures dropping off 
from El Nino to La Nina, the fastest ever recorded, as well as the sunspot activity dropping off a cliff, taking us right down into the grand solar minimum far faster than anyone had anticipated. And the forecast going out for an average count of 25 sunspots or less over this next cycle. And with the intensification of La Nina, which is going to be a super Nina because it always follows strength-wise what El Nino does. All of these coupled together with Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, the AMO turning cold, the Pacific turning cold, and the sunspots and the sun's activity declining. The winter is going to start incredibly early in Europe this year. So the damage that was incurred during the spring, the snows are going to come in early September this year. There's a four month window to grow crops. And this is just the beginning from this year forward. It's going to intensify. The season will be very short this year for growing. Food prices are going to drive up. There's a loss of 80% of the cherry crop across Europe right now. Vineyards are also having difficulty throughout Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy. Everywhere they grow wine in, in Europe right now is having losses. The fruit production stretches all the way from Turkey clear over to Spain. And they are talking 80 90% loss of the fruit crops, including apricots and cherries. There's going to be a substantial drive on prices, especially fruit coming right now. You're looking at four or five times the price for cherries coming up. So if you can go long on cherries on some forward fund that I don't know about, that is a definite place to put your cash for a short term gain is on cherries. And any of you collectors out there who specifically are into these areas in Austria, you're going to need to try to secure your bottles beforehand. Uh, there will not be enough supply, as you can see, with those kind of losses. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video. The food price increases are starting right now. Globally, this is not the only place that they are having problems. The United States, China, also having problems with late, cold, damaging crops. And as always, if you like the information contained within the video, I would ask you to support me on Patreon. I'll leave a link below there.